you have an incredible journey that you've been on. And so I want all the people out there to hear your testimony, hear the insights that um, you've learned along the way. You've uh, just really mastered the world of Hollywood. And I think that um, I think your perspective is so valuable to a lot of people who are out there watching. Um, but yeah, why don't we just maybe take start off by just uh, kind of getting to know who you are, um, just hearing a little bit of your story. And maybe if you if you can, I'll, I'll kind of give you a, a quick bio for you know who Teddy is, since I think he's so humble, he's not going to share everything. So I'll, I'll start it off. And then maybe Teddy, if you want to just give us a, a, a little bit more color into who you are and the kind of work that you're doing. Um, but Teddy Z is a Chinese film producer. He's an executive whose films um, have amassed over $2.6 billion in revenue. He served as executive vice president at Columbia Pictures, a senior vice president at Paramount Pictures, president of Sony-based Overbrook Films, uh, president of Fox-based Davis Entertainment, now under the banner of Teddy Z Productions. You're a member of the Oscars, the Emmys, the Producers Guild of America, and um, you've also built an active consulting and advisory practice that spans media, technology, commerce, um, while bridging Hollywood with Asia. And so there's no uh, shortage of accomplishments and just amazing work that you've done. So um, I know you've been a part of a lot of different films, including Saving Face, which is a, a very important film for uh, the Asian American community, as well as the you know, the LGBT community and, and many others. You've also been a part of producing movies like Hitch and The Pursuit of Happiness. I guess I'll start with, you know, I guess, you know, Teddy, if you want to maybe just jump in and fill any gaps in that bio, maybe talk a little bit about how you started in the film world and then we could kind of go from there. Yeah, um, you know, I think I, I started in the film world because uh, I couldn't get a job in the TV world. Okay. Um, I grew up as a TV addict and I probably watched 70 to 80 hours a week. It was the television was always on. And of course, this was during a time when there was no Internet. There were three players in the television business and uh, it really shaped who I was, uh, helped me understand uh, America and uh, pop culture, what it was all about. And because we grew up pretty poor um television was my ticket to the world oh wow yeah. what um what was like the first job you had in hollywood well i am embarrassed to say but the first job was a dream job wow uh my first job was as creative executive at paramount pictures no kidding um yeah this was in 1985 i believe and uh uh, I mean, I showed up, I really had no experience in creative fields. I had no experience in uh, film industry. Um, but that first job, I was given a, a secretary, an expense account wow. and, uh, and a parking space with my name on it. So that was, uh, something that was pretty mind blowing, uh, in a world where you had to generally pay your dues by working in the mailroom or being in an assistant or yep. uh yeah so it was it was pretty unprecedented so normally you know you have to kind of make your way up starting at you know starting with a you know a production assistant job and kind of work your up that ladder how did you start there what was what was the kind of route that you took to make that even possible well um it was really it was sort of a long road um, I didn't even realize that it was possible to have a job in Hollywood in the creative areas. Wow. Um, my first job out of uh, undergraduate uh, program at Cornell was with NBC okay. uh, in New York City. Um, I was in human resources. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked on the uh, staffing the Olympics in Russia that never happened because they were canceled. Okay. And uh, when I, I got moved out to Burbank, and it was there that I met the president of NBC. His name was Jeff Sagansky. And I realized, wow, this guy was responsible for putting on a third of all TV shows on television. Wow. And, you know, it's sort of like when you're on, uh, when you're on Amazon 
shopping. You're not thinking about how it works. You're thinking about, look at all the stuff they offer. Mm -hmm. So it light bulb went off and said, wow, this, this guy actually dictates the taste of an entire nation. Wow. And I said, how did you get this job? Right. And he, during his explanation, all I heard was Harvard Business School. So, of course, um, being naive and filled with dreams, I said, okay. So I applied to Harvard Business School. No kidding. And um, I was able to, uh, well, the first thing I did was I, I, I left Human Resources and I took a job um, in something called Teletext. And that was the precursor to the internet. It was a way in France where people accessed information uh, like sports or news through their television set. Um, so I was in charge of creating this, um, this test, this technology test. And I was able to use that platform that opportunity to get into Harvard Business School. I wow. told, told a story about how groundbreaking of an opportunity it was and, and parlayed that into admissions into the toughest business school in the world at the time, which, wow. which was culture shock because um, I didn't really fit in there. How so? Well, it's really the story of my life. I really didn't fit in anywhere I went. I was a square peg uh, trying to fit into a round hole. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of people who were wanting to go work at Goldman Sachs or McKinsey, uh, very um, buttoned up and uh, very ambitious. And here I was uh, from California in my shorts and t-shirt right. showing up for class and it was culture shock. Wow. It really was. So, you know, and, and you were also, um, I guess, kind of coming into this from a perspective of an Asian American who had grown up, I guess, part of your time. You, did you grow up here in the U.S. or did you live in Asia? And what was that like sort of coming and being integrated into this sort of new culture? Yeah, I was, I was born in uh, upstate New York. My parents were Chinese immigrants. Yeah. Um, they had uh, very little. My mom was not educated. My dad had a second grade education. Uh, he taught himself how to read and write um, English. He, by a stroke of luck, uh, during World War II and right after, he worked as a merchant marine and enlisted in the U.S. Navy. That gave him citizenship, so he became an American. Right. Uh, moved to New York City and uh, worked in the hotels and restaurant business. And then uh, I, I, he ended up in the Borscht Belt, the Jewish resort capital of uh, New York at the time. And um, that's where I was born. So uh, fish out of water. Grew up in Liberty, a town of 5,000 people, predominantly not Asian. Right. Um, and we stuck out like a sore thumb. Wow. What was your childhood like and how did that give you the drive and the success that uh, you needed to, to make it in the Hollywood world? You know, it's, it's easy to rewrite history. You know, I, I, I think at the time I thought my life was just normal, uh, but we were poor. Um, my dad uh, made, uh, his peak earning years made $16,000 a year. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, I had, uh, there were four of us. I was the youngest and we all went to college. We all went uh, to uh, beyond uh, four year program into graduate programs. And uh, it's a it's sort of like uh, the success story of most uh, Asian Americans in that stereotype about overachieving. My, my dad uh, worked really, really hard. And um, it's just something that I, 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 he was my role model. I only knew wow. how to work hard. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, you, you made it to um, grad school. What, what kind of skill sets did you learn um, uh, in school that sort of enabled you to succeed in um, Hollywood? 
Well, the first thing I learned was out of a section of 90 students that there was one or two people in that group that were just totally lights out genius. Right. So smart, so gifted beyond anything that I could ever be, um, which was intimidating. But at the same token, there were probably five or 10 people that I thought, how did they get into Harvard Business School? Oh, my mm -hmm. goodness. Um, so the first thing I learned was um, I fit in. Wow. I mean, uh, yeah. I'm intimidated, but I got over that. And uh, they're just regular people. And everybody had their own dream and their own ambitions and desires. Um, but, uh, you know, I had, to, I had to fake it a little bit. I had to fake it because there are people who were so smart and so accomplished. And, uh, you know, it was clearly the fake it till you make it kind of thing. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, so you went from business school to, and then you, so you went back to Hollywood at that point. What kind of skill sets did you have um, that made you sort of stand out amongst your peers? And how did you kind of leverage those skills to succeed in Hollywood? Well, I think uh, there's two things. So number one, uh, I realized that I'm a storyteller, mm -hmm. that I had enough awareness about myself to try to figure out how I was different, what my competitive advantage might be, right? So that was number one, um, trying to weave a story and brand myself. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing was quickly realizing that my biggest weakness could also be turned into my biggest strength. Wow. Um, I think most uh, Asian Americans can relate to this. You walk into a room and there's no hiding who you are or what you look like. Your first identity is defined by the way people look at you. Sure. Right. So um, there was a stereotype then there's a stereotype now. And that stereotype was not very creative, not very funny, not leader, mm -hmm. um, not confident, not outgoing. Oh. So um, what I tried to do was, was use that to stand out and say, yeah, here I am. Um, consider me an accessory. Consider mm -hmm. me a luxury accessory. Because the woman that ended up hiring me wa used to work at Armani. Hmm. And she was a branding expert. She she even made Armani toilet paper. Wow. So in my research, I tried to create an identity for myself that said, look, I'm not a 20 year old kid. I'm, I'm I went to business school. I was with the best and the brightest. And you know what? I had no fear. Hmm. So if I walk into a room with anybody in Hollywood, I'm not going to back down. Wow. Now, I don't know if that worked, but boy, I was faking it and I was scared, but uh, it was the story I told and I stuck to it. Wow. So you're now you're a Hollywood exec. You're you feel like you're sort of um, you don't qualify, but you're in a position of extreme kind of significance and influence. What was the process that you went through to make movies make films, turn an idea into something that would hit the box office? Like, what was that whole sort of uh, journey like? I think the most important thing was having a dream. Yeah. Okay. So many people told me, <laughs> you can't do that. Yeah. All I heard was no for most of my life about the things I wanted to do. Wow. And I didn't believe the no's. I only believed the yeses. Mm -hmm. And when you come to Hollywood, that is the most popular word that you hear. Everybody has the power to say mm -hmm. no. Right. Very few people have the power to say yes. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think um, the idea is that who do you believe? Are you going to believe the world around you? Or is there something that's driving you far above and beyond what you can grasp immediately? 
Mm -hmm. And I was so naive. I didn't know anybody. I didn't have connections. Um, I didn't have a network. Um, but I thought that I had this dream and I thought it could come true. Wow. Now, when I, when I look back on it, I don't know who planted that seed in me. Mm -hmm. But I realized, even though my father had no education, mm -hmm. here's a man who I had a tough relationship with. But how does a guy with a second grade education from outside of Shanghai end up in U.S. Yeah. with four kids on $16,000 a year, right. putting everybody through college. I mean, right. I, I seriously still don't know how he did it. And obviously, <laughs> he didn't take no for an answer either. Right, right. What, what was his um, reaction when he heard that you were going into the film world? I, I think uh, anything became possible when First off, I went to Cornell. Right. Yeah. Right? So I got into Ivy League school. There you go. Then I went to work at NBC. You know how proud my parents were when they said, you know, you turn on Channel 4 and our son works there. Mm -hmm. Now, nobody cared what job I had. Right, right. Right. But that's where I worked. Right. And then I got into Harvard Business School. Right. If I got into Harvard Business School, I could do anything I wanted and they would buy it. So I did not have any pressure from my parents because literally I outdid anything my parents could have dreamed of just by going to college. Wow. Yeah. Um, I want to dive into some of the films that you were a part of. And there's some extraordinary stories that um, you've been a part of putting together. Uh, one of them was Saving Face. And if you can kind of talk through kind of the passion and the, and the vision behind that film, how did it come together and what significance did it have in terms of the impact in your life and in, in the life of many Asian Americans that you've encountered? Um, what was that? Um, what was the reaction to that film? You know, it's um, my, my philosophy is always um, try to support the underdog. Mm -hmm. because I'm an underdog. I overcame such odds. Yeah. So um, I was a part of CAPE, mm -hmm. the uh, Coalition of Asian Pacifics in, in uh, entertainment. And uh, I was judging uh, one of the judges for a screenwriting competition, and I read it. I read wow. Saving Face, and I thought it was head and shoulders above anything out there. Wow. And uh, the the fellow judges and I ended up awarding her with the best screenplay award, Alice Wu. Mm -hmm. And that was it. And um, so Alice and I be, uh, started a relationship and uh, she lived in New York. Cape was holding uh, their annual um, gala. And I said, Hey, why don't you uh, fly out for it? Wow. You never know what could happen. Mm -hmm. And um, she flew out. Uh, there were two people there. Uh, one was Fritz Friedman, who was um, uh, vice president or senior vice president of publicity for Sony Home Entertainment. And Lexine Wong, who was uh, executive vice president of marketing at Sony Pictures Home Entertainment. And uh, I pulled them aside and I said, hey, your boss has budget to make a movie. Mm -hmm. You should go and read her script. Mm -hmm. And they did. And they, over the weekend, they read it and they loved it. And it was greenlit virtually the next week. Wow. So it was, it was incredible. You know, I know there, there's a lot of um, uh, filmmakers out there and especially Asian American filmmakers who are hungry to tell their story and do it in a way that's uh, very personal and authentic and real. What would be your kind of advice to them, uh, given your experience seeing Saving Face, you know, become what it has, how would you sort of advise them in terms of telling their own stories and then making that get onto the kind of independent film or the big, you know, Hollywood film circuit? You know, it's, I, I, I really don't know. <laughs> not, <laughs> not everybody's life 
is worthy of a film. Mm -hmm. uh, but the key thing that you said was real and authentic. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know how many scripts I read in my lifetime that were about the Asian American experience, but a lot of them sounded like they were cut from the same formula. Mm -hmm. And Alice's just raped of Alice. Wow. She, you know, it's so funny because it's a, it's literally a, a, a genre film. It's, it's a love story. It's around family. It's yeah. as formula as you can get. Right. But she, she infused it with her voice and her identity. Mm -hmm. And uh, the same thing can be said for her film on Netflix that just premiered a couple of weeks ago called The Half of It. Right. And if you, if you know Alice, there's nobody else who could have made that film. Mm -hmm. So she was really unique and she tapped into her own voice and um, magic happened. Wow. What, what distinguishes people like Alice from other storytellers in terms of, I mean, authenticity is one thing, but how do you sort of take that authenticity and experiences that you've lived and turn that into a powerful script um, or a film? So a lot of people talk the talk. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think um, my life is great and I'm a big talent and um, my life is worthy of the big screen. Mm -hmm. And Alice didn't think that way. Mm -hmm. Alice didn't talk about that. Mm -hmm. Alice did it. She right. actually wrote the script. She was a software engineer at Microsoft, I believe. Wow. And in her spare time, she wrote and rewrote. And and she, I don't think she was thinking about going to a movie premiere. Mm -hmm. I think she needed to tell this story. Mm -hmm. And it was something that, you know, it's, it's not about her finding her purpose. Uh, her purpose found her. Wow. I mean, she was dogged. And, and. The other thing is she walks, talks, and acts like a director through and through. Mm -hmm. um, she, there's no faking it. Wow. And I think there's, there, I would, you know, there's sort of a similarity between her, what you described about her, and what you kind of went through in your own experience. You know, um, you had that hard work ethic, but you also had this desire to um, be authentic and real. So talk about kind of what, when that shift happened between – you know, you said early on you were sort of faking it till you made it, but then there came a point when you, um, was there a shift when you realized that there had to be sort of an authenticity about who you are and figuring out how to sort of t make that come um, alive in the work that you did? I don't think I was ever authentic or real wow. during my career, to be honest. Wow. Um, I think that's one of the things that, I paid a big price for. I felt like I didn't have um, integrity. I didn't have a soul. I didn't. I didn't know who I was. Wow. I became whoever I needed to be. Wow. Um, so in any situation, I was a, a chameleon. Um, okay. I, so that was that was a real gift. I I could go into any situation and be who I needed to be, but I didn't know who I was. Wow. Wow. I mean, it, it, that's probably the reason why you were able to become, you know, the senior vice president or an executive or, you know, president of, of these studios. But what is it about Hollywood or maybe just any industry that made you or made you or compelled you to sort of continue to put up this facade and, and what was it doing to your soul? You know, um, we all have our, our family histories. We all have our brokenness, our problems. Yeah. And I'm no different, you know. And I just, you know, I don't think my parents would ever understand the concept of psychology, uh, psychiatrist, emotions. We were taught to swallow it all. Wow. What, whatever, whatever pain anybody had, you had to ignore it. 
Mm. You had to put it in a different compartment and fight through it. So I realized looking back that my parents were severely emotionally crippled and depressed for most of their lives. Wow. And there was a lot of uh, abuse uh, in my family. And uh, one of the ways you deal with it and survive is you learn survival skills. Mm -hmm. You don't learn um, emotion. You don't learn awareness or being healthy. You just learn to cope. And whatever coping mechanism that is, you find to survive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank you for, I mean, just being so honest and vulnerable and real. Um, and I know that there's probably people who are watching this who may feel the same level of um, feeling trapped or feeling like they have to put up a facade. Um, I guess, can, can you speak to kind of what were the symptoms of that that, were, that you sort of noticed along the way in your time in Hollywood where you realize that there's something wrong with just my mental state or my soul or my heart? Like what was, what was going on in your life that made you realize that this was a problem? Well, uh, you know, you don't know there's a problem until your world falls apart. Yeah. You only know in the moment, am I, am I, um, am I working? Am I productive? Yeah. Am I ma making money? Those are the only things that counted. Yeah. Right. So if you suffered, you suffered. So what were some of the symptoms looking back? It was uh, not being emotionally honest, being uh, lying in situations, not knowing who you are, um, substance abuse, um, not having healthy relationships, not knowing how to love, wow. not knowing how to love or not knowing how to be loved. And I think that was the biggest thing. Yeah. No, thank and des you. desperately wanting it, but not knowing how to get it. Wow. Yeah. And I, I think that's the interesting thing is that when you're in that state, you're, you're so hungry for it and you want to sort of get that from whatever you can. And, you know, I, I went through a similar season in my life and I think that that's what caused, you know, a lot of broken relationships where you're just sort of taking and taking and taking at the expense of other people or at the expense of your, your, your own well-being. And, you know, I could see how this world, it, it sort of encourages that, right? It encourages you to become successful, even at the cost of uh, taking care of your heart, your soul, your sense of value, your being. And um, it could leave you sort of empty and dry. Um, and I love that about who you are, you know, Teddy, is that even in this season of your life, you've come to understand that and you're starting to talk about that and you're starting to embrace that. I'd love for you to just share, you know, for people out there who are feeling the same thing, how did you get to a point where you realized that this was a problem or when you hit that rock bottom, what was the steps that you took to start to get better? Um, you know, people look at my life and they like to define it by my labels, by uh, my successes, by my film credits, by the companies I work for and at and the schools I attended. And I, I'm, I'm guilty of that too, right. right? That's how we brand ourselves. Right. So, but nobody looks underneath the surface. Nobody looks at all the failures in your life, the broken relationships, Mm -hmm. The fear that constantly haunts you. When you're in Hollywood, you're always looking over your shoulder. Or I don't mean to generalize. Sure. I was always looking over my shoulder. First, I always thought the fraud police would show up and say, we, we, we know who you really are. You don't deserve to be here. Wow. Okay. So then there's the feeling that everybody is trying to gun for you. Mm -hmm. That everybody can't believe you got the job that they wanted mm -hmm. and everybody loves um, bad news around other people. Wow. And maybe I look back and maybe 
that was me projecting onto other people. Wow. But I do know that Hollywood is a land of dreams and a land of brokenness and people trying to fill a void with fame or money or something. Right, right. You know, but I was attracted to it. Not, I've, I don't think I've ever been motivated by money or, or fame. I just, I just wanted to be one productive. I didn't want to have to work for something that I couldn't be passionate about. Right. And I really, I have to admit it. And it's so pathetic. I just wanted to be liked. Wow. I just yeah. wanted to be admired. And I'm still that way. Sure. sure. You know, I'm still that way. Yeah. I think, you know, you are, you, so your story is so unique in that you've actually tasted the peaks of success in Hollywood, which is probably the dream of hundreds of thousands of people out there who want to make it in this industry. Uh, I'd love for you just to take a moment just to talk about what, you know, what, what was that like being at the top when you see a film that you produced get, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue or, you know, get you get to brush shoulders with the top actors in Hollywood. You know, a lot of people see that as sort of the answer to their deepest hunger and their soul. And you, you've been there. And so I'd love for you to sort of speak to that, you know, is what is the truth behind these dreams that you've, you're pursuing all along? And, and what kind of perspective can you give people out there who are in that fight to kind of get to where you were? You know, being around famous people was not fun. It's not fun. It's not fun when you don't feel like you are a part of the club, when you don't mm. belong. So you're always, there's stress involved. Mm -hmm. So um, that was not a big attraction for me. But again, it was always about, hey, I got what everybody else wants. Right. You know, and I, that defines me. So I'm now deserving or I'm worth it or I'm, it's worthy. It makes me worthy of being loved wow. or wanted. And that's, that's the hunger that I had more than anything else. Just, wow. love, you know, yeah. Yeah. I think that's, um, it's, you know, that's it's, kinda... it's funny because I see some of my high school classmates uh, <laughs> who are watching wow. and I, you know, when I went back for a high school reunion and I talked a little bit about my vulnerabilities. Yeah. N nobody could see them. Right. I was so gifted at hiding it. Yeah. That I think I hid it from myself. Wow. So I think the devil is so powerful that the biggest lies we tell mm -hmm. are the ones that we tell ourselves. Right. And the lie I told more than anything was, I'm um, just not worth it. Wow. You know? Wow. And how, how, how crazy that, you know, you were looking for that worth and you were looking to be admired and you were looking to be loved and you were, you know, you had so much Hollywood success. And even in that situation, that season of your life, you weren't able to find it there. And I think you're right. That, that's the, that's such a big lie that we all have fallen into in this world where we think that, okay, once I get to a certain level of achievements, I'm going to feel worthy. I'm going to feel loved. I'm going to have that sense of fulfillment in my life that I've always been looking for. And all along, you were looking for something deeper, something, some truth that was um, much more valuable. And I'd love to kind of turn to that part of your story because I think that's so beautiful and that, that, that chapter in your life is um, a source of encouragement for a lot of people who are watching. So can you talk about what, what that kind of... Um, Rock yeah, bottom moment for you was let, let you know uh, to really bottom line it is that you look at my outside my accomplishments and you you get envious and then you look that I was married and uh, had two beautiful children and you think here's a guy who has it all right and uh, I just was not capable of having an emotionally mature relationship. Um, I was thought I was doing a great job, but obviously I wasn't. I was so unhappy. I was not faithful. I was not a good husband. 
and um, it my world fell apart because of it. Wow. So look, it's it's easy. It's easy for me to tell people what they should do. I, I can never do that. Everybody deserves the right to go through and learn their own lessons. And my lesson uh, involved me hitting rock bottom and crashing. Yeah. And after the biggest success in my life of hitch and pursuit of happiness, I had and saving face right on top of each other. I mm -hmm. mean, Hitch made $160 million, was the highest, wow. highest scoring uh, film in, that previewed in history at the time, and then Pursuit of Happiness. Mm -hmm. But that was also the time that my life fell apart. Wow. And crashed and burned. Wow. And, um, you know, I don't want to talk too much about it out of respect for my family and my ex-wife because... Mm -hmm. um, this was entirely something of my doing, mm -hmm. but I was not happy um, being married and I was not happy at all. My professional life hit rock bottom because my personal life hit rock bottom and um, I was close to suicidal. Wow. Yeah, that's um, I'm so inspired and um, amazed by uh, your your truth and your vulnerability. And I just want to thank you again for sharing all of that. Um, can you talk about finding God in this season? Like you, you, you know, this, in this darkness, you know, your faith is what turned things around. And I'd love to hear more about what that journey was like for you. Um, you know, I was, I had a, a hunger my entire life. I, I just knew that I was empty and I tried to fill it with whatever I could, whether it was just alcohol or sex or, or films, it was just escape mm -hmm. and um, nothing worked. It was like a bottomless well. Mm -hmm. I had a, a voracious appetite that nothing could satisfy it. Mm -hmm. And um I remember going to, as a kid, going to church with a friend, going to a Catholic service, to a mass, and having chills running up and down my spine, or going to a bar mitzvah and feeling like, I just want to be Jewish. I just want to, I just want to be a part of this, or going to church and saying, I, I just, I want that. I want to, I want God's love, but I didn't, I didn't understand it. I just wanted to be a part of something. And I, and I remember Christmas time with my family celebrating Christmas. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember how old I was, but I distinctly remember sitting around and saying to myself, we are celebrating the birth of somebody mm -hmm. where we have a tree, mm -hmm. we're exchanging presents, but I feel like we're all playing in, uh, in, actors in a play that we're just going through the motions. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like I was tired of going through the motions in my life of playing the part. Mm -hmm. And I had, um, when I hit rock bottom, I remember just um, looking up at the ceiling, giving up and saying, God, if you're real, I just surrender it all to you. Wow. Yeah. When when was this, and um, how has things been different since then? Well, I'll tell you the the thing that changed my life more than anything, besides hitting rock bottom. Yeah. Was meeting Julia Lee. Okay. <laughs> I met her in Korea, in Seoul, on November sixteenth, two thousand and seven. Wow. And wow. I just knew that she was the difference in my life. Wow. And that night, she wanted nothing to do with me. <laughs> and right. I, I said to her, we're going to be married. Wow, no kidding. Our future is linked forever. You just knew. I just knew. And something about what I said 
rang true to her. And wow. she was, she was, had, went from wanting nothing to do with me wow. to, to giving me a chance. And I called her, I left Seoul the next day and I called her every day when I woke up and every night when I went to sleep. Wow. And I sent an email every day asking her to send me a picture. Mm. And she had a trip planned to LA January 9th, 2008. She came. And since then, my life has gone 180 degrees. Um, wow. Her f entire family are devout Christians. Mm -hmm. Her sister and brother-in-law are pastors. Um, her parents didn't speak any English. And when, when I met them, their first question was, are you Christian? <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not. Right. And her, it was Julia, who was a lapsed Christian. And her and her family prayed for us every wow. day. And every day from 2008 until 2015, when um, we came to Christ, uh, it was Thanksgiving, uh, Arlington, Virginia, or Fairfax, Virginia, and uh, um, they had an intercession with uh, Julia, and uh, Julia said, yeah, I want to come home, prodigal daughter, wow. and they asked um, if I minded, and I said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm in, and literally from that day, I felt... Uh, I felt my life change drastically. Mm, wow. That, that right there sounds like a, a movie. And um, that's the, uh, it's, it's really cool. I, I'll just say on a personal note, no, it reminds me of, um, you know, meeting my wife, Jan, as well. And it was her faith in God and just the light that she was that took, pulled me out of my pit as well. And so I, I was going through a very similar dark season in my life when I hit my rock bottom. And I think meeting Jan, seeing the joy and the light that she was, and hearing, I think, I, I feel like I really heard God's voice in that time. And I heard, I felt like I was um, meant to be with her. And it was her, her presence in my life that really just turned my life around. And I'll tell you, I mean, just hearing your story, it's just, it's so true that, you know, those moments, those relationships, um, God uses that to really bring redemption and healing and um, uh, transformation in the lives of, of so many. I'll, I'll tell you why she was so instrumental, because um, I, I understand that I was living my life very selfishly. And everything was about me and taking away the pain. Yeah. And... I learned through Julia because I wanted her so much that it couldn't be about me that I had to put somebody else before me. Wow. And that was training wheels for, yeah. for, for becoming a Christian where I surrendered everything to Jesus Christ. Wow. So um, I think that was, was really instrumental about no longer, uh, being about me. Yeah. Wow. So in that sense, your, your perspective shifted from how can I achieve my level of success? How can I be admired by this world of Hollywood executives? How can I have a successful movie to now? How can I serve this woman? And in doing so, everything shifted. It was just about that. It was just about love. It was just about that relationship, that genuine relationship of loving someone else that pulls you out of this spiritual, physical pit that you're in. Well, I, I want to back up a little bit because when I was a studio executive, I, I did um, see a movie called, uh, um, what was the movie? It was Chow Yun Fat, The Killer. Okay. And I saw that guy and it was like, wow, <laughs> right. that is the most charismatic, sexy man alive. And, and <laughs> I, I set out to bring him to Hollywood and make a film for him. Wow. But uh, up until that point, I was I was a banana. I was, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I got through Hollywood being a Jewish guy, mm -hmm. you know. 
Yeah. And uh, that was the beginning of me um, reclaiming my identity. Wow. And when I got separated and I was near bottom, mm -hmm. um, it was the Asian American community that welcomed me. No kidding. And I felt like the prodigal son. I came out and it was people like Catherine Park. Mm-hmm. Steve Liu, you know, Emily Liu, people who were not afraid of being Asian American, not afraid mm -hmm. of being Chinese. Mm -hmm. Ted, Ted Kim. Right. Kimber Lim, people who just looked at me and accepted me no matter what. And it was like, not only that, they treated me like a hero. Wow. And it was that kind of love that I got from the Asian American community that I thought, wow, I don't deserve this. People were ascribing all kinds of incredible um, acts of, of uh, generosity and compassion to me that I'm not sure was there. Mm -hmm. And it was really out of sense of gratitude that I realized, wow, I, I have to, my identity is in being Chinese American. My identity is to take care of those who are taking care of me. Wow. And wow. so it started with uh, the Asian American community being so non judgmental about any of the wrongs that I have done mm -hmm. and desperately needing somebody to lead. And, and they forced me to step up, mm -hmm. to step up to try to be a better person. Um, it's so funny. I, I, I was I was awarded a local hero award by KCET. I didn't deserve that, mm -hmm. but I it opened up a network. I met um, Welly and Welly Yang and Dina, who I now am the godfather of their children, and wow. they're just you know they just loved me. Mm. And and Welly was the producer of the Asian Excellence Awards. That was. That was the celebration of Asian America. He dragged me along. Yeah. I, it's, it's, I just got lucky almost in every step of my life in having people help uh, have, have me join them in their causes. Wow. And I think it also kind of shifted your focus to then give back to the Asian community. Because I know... When we, when we said that we were going to have you as our guest for this soul combo, there's so many people that reached out and said, hey, you know, Teddy Z is um, incredible. Um, he's a mentor. He's a leader. He's someone that served this community. And it seems like you really, that shift kind of sparked something in you where you said, hey, I want to now use my talents, my experiences to now pour back into this next generation of creatives and storytellers and filmmakers. What was that? What has that been like for you? It's kept me young yeah. for next generations of people that I can get excited about, that I can help usher uh, into their dreams, into their purpose. If I could do that, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I feel like I'm fulfilling why I was placed on this earth. I've been given incredible riches of experiences, and I, I'll include all the horrible things that happened in my life as riches. Wow. Because until I got my ass kicked, <laughs> I didn't wake up. Mm. And I feel like I'm 63 years old. I have, wow. I'm in the third act of my life. I yeah. have a lot of work to do. I have so much more to accomplish. Big, huge things with a lot of incredible people. Mm. So I no longer want to be a person who talks the talk. I want to walk it each and every day. Mm -hmm. And it's not just for Asian Americans. It's not just for Christians. It's, I want to, I want to use the platforms and the riches that I've been given and the talents that I've been uh, handed to me. Yeah. And I want to have them make sense. I wow. want them to have impact for generations. Wow. Yeah. yeah. 
that's beautiful. And um, I'm, I'm curious if there's um, creatives out there or Asian Americans or even Christians out there who are asking, you know, how do I uh, get to Hollywood? But also, how do I even in this time of preparation prepare to go to a place like Hollywood or Los Angeles and make sure that I'm protected, or I'm, I'm ready, or I've got the character or the leadership or the skills that I need to go, go there and land on my two feet and make it there. What's your advice to them? You know, somebody messaged me on, uh, on uh, Instagram because I said I'd, I'd try to answer as many questions. And somebody yeah. asked me, uh, they want to make it in Hollywood. What book should they read? Mm -hmm. And I, I really had no clue. So my knee-jerk reaction was, and it's true, um, read the Bible, <laughs> right? right? And I felt like that was a, it's a true answer, but um, it's not something that people really would gravitate to. And then I, then I realized, okay, let me, let me recommend a book called The Hollywood Commandments. Mm -hmm. It's by Devon Franklin, and it's largely about the book of Daniel. How this person, Daniel, who was taken into slavery, basically, right. um, in the Babylonian Empire, and how he was able to thrive. And the way he was able to thrive was by trusting in his faith, mm -hmm. by not selling out, but leaning on his faith and his beliefs. And right. by doing so, he tapped into a power that was way beyond his own. Wow. And uh, Devon, who I met when I was at Overbrook, I was the president of Overbrook, and he was an assistant. And I had no idea that he was religious at all. Mm -hmm. But I just saw him as a sincere, honest person who mm -hmm. had passion. And wherever I could go, I tried to help people like him. Mm -hmm. And I recommended him for uh, a role as a creative executive at MGM when he wasn't getting the shots and he got the job. And I recommended him for a VP role at Sony, which he ended up getting. And he wrote, uh, he's a best-selling author and he was kind enough to give me credit for it. But why I say this is because as a Seventh-day Adventist, he observed the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And every Friday at sundown, he would say, sorry, I have to leave. I have to go home. I can't answer the phone. Um, that's just the way it is. Wow. And he tapped into his power. And now he's one of the most prolific producers. He makes movies about his faith. He's a best-selling author. He's on the talk show circuit. He is a guy who's found balance in his personal life, in his professional life. And uh, that's the hardest thing. Do you have to sell out? Can you, can you live uh, in the world um, and be a Christian? You know, it's the number, I, I work for um, Biola University, uh, mm -hmm. evangelical school in Southeastern LA. And uh, I was helping them with their um, film school. Mm -hmm. And the number one issue is, a lot of the students feel like, how can I balance out my faith with the world of Hollywood, number right. one? And number two, how, how, you know, this image of Hollywood just persecuting Christians. Mm -hmm. And uh, all I know is Hollywood persecutes everybody. Wow. It's an equal opportunity discriminator. They wow. will just eat you alive no matter who you are. Just the fact that you happen to be Christian is, is besides the point. Mm -hmm. um, but it's another example of what God has done in my life. Uh, you know, I've worked in Hollywood for 30 years. He, uh, I, somehow I was placed with Biola. Um, their film school has been around for a long time. And yeah. uh, God worked through me. And, and uh, we were able to get them recognized by Variety Magazine and uh, The Wrap as one of the top 40 film schools in the world. Wow. And uh, the work they're doing is truly incredible. Um, I'm, I'm all about planting seeds. And each one of these film students who's a Christian is a seed for telling great stories. Mm -hmm. The Bible is 
the collection of the greatest stories ever told. Mm -hmm. right. And the, the more, uh, the more Christians we have in Hollywood, the more we can do good. Yeah, no, I think Teddy, we're, um, we're right in the heart of uh, the conversation. And, you know, the, the reason why we're having these conversations is to really highlight and honor um, creatives who are in the film industry to share their stories and to encourage the next generation of storytellers and filmmakers. Um, but, you know, I think you the, the, you know, you just brought up Daniel in the story of, in the Bible. And I think his story is such a phenomenal example of what it means to be a light in a very dark place. And, um, you know, he did that with excellence. He did that by standing apart. He did that with conviction. And that's no easy feat, you know, because going into Hollywood um, is a place of, of darkness, just to be very frank and honest. It's a place that will eat you up. And if you don't have the convictions and the principles and the faith and the relationship with God to sort of stand on, um, it's, it's going to be very easy to fall apart. So I'd love to kind of hear from, you know, your experiences um, in your own journey and also working with other filmmakers in the industry. Um, you mentioned reading the Bible, reading books, what what can they what can people do practically to do to prepare now to um, go into Hollywood and be a light in that place? Um, I, I, I'm really not sure about career wise, but I all I know is get a network of people that can support you. Yeah. When when I first became a Christian, I reached out to. Uh, Two two guys, Carl Choi and 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 Sungmo, yep. uh, Cho, because I knew they were Christians and I knew they were really true believers. So I I needed help. Yeah, and I was selfish again in needing their spiritual guidance. Wow, and those two brothers were just. They, they stepped up big time and they really uh, lit a fire in me. Wow. And uh, so we went from two people uh, to seven. And I asked people around me like Esther Song and Josh Song and others to, um, to join our Bible study. And I, I picked the most God-loving people I could <laughs> so that I could just uh, absorb all of that knowledge. I was so hungry. I was, I had it to, I had to get that support because I had to play catch up. Mm -hmm. And so the, went from three of us to seven to 10 to 15 to 20. And we had a Bible study, Julie and I in our home that has been going on for five years and over 300 people have come through. Wow. And many of them are creatives, young Hollywood. And these are the people that they, they give me credit for being like, you know, the, the elder figure, the, the pastor, the minister kind of thing. I'm learning from them. Wow. I learn so much from them. I feel like I, I um, get 10 times more than I give. And the only cost is just opening my home. Wow. So, so having a network of people that you trust, that you can bounce things in, off of, that you can um, uh, just have them pray for you, it's so crucial. Yeah. You know, we all think that God has a plan for us that includes walking a red carpet. And I, I, I just don't believe that that's for everybody, but I do think that the fellowship and the brotherhood of, of, of being a believer yeah. can enable the best to come out of you. <laughs> that's beautiful. And I think that's true for whatever industry you're in, you know, yes. surrounding yourselves with believers or people who will support you through the thick and thin. Um, I want to open it up for people to ask questions. You can hit the question button on the bottom um, and, you know, submit your question and I'll monitor and um, ask those to Teddy. But as, as we get those questions in, Teddy, I'm curious um, if you have thoughts on what, what are your projects that you're working on now 
and what is your vision for how you can continue to engage Hollywood? So it's, it's funny because um, a lot of people want to define me by being in Hollywood. And I think uh, more than half of my projects are not Hollywood. Mm -hmm. um, and it's where God has taken me. I, you know, I'm in a, a venture now where I, I don't even believe tech company. And the CEO is the, uh, was the CFO of Amgen, a, a major biotech company. The COO was in supply chain at Disney. Mm -hmm. And um, they make CBD. Okay. And CBD is something that I never wanted to get involved with because uh, from a business standpoint, because I thought it was, you know, marijuana. It was mm -hmm. illegal. Right. But they, they make their CBD um, from the oils from orange peels. Okay. So it has all the benefits of regular CBD from cannabis or hemp, but it has none of the THC contaminants, heavy metals, pesticides. And um, I uh, brokered a deal to take it into 1,500 stores. Wow. And uh, we're hopefully closing that deal next week. And and really changing and disrupting that space. So that's an example of you never know where God is taking you. You don't know what he's doing. Right. I don't think it's anything that I could have ever predicted, mm -hmm. but I didn't resist and I went for it. So that, that's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, um, I have a pastor. He's incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, Teray Roberts. Yep. Okay. So my wife, uh, went with Grace Sue to this church called uh, The One in LA, the Potter's House One LA. Mm -hmm. And she came home and was screaming about what an incredible guy he is. Yeah. And I'm, I'm like, what am I going to do at a black church? Right. <laughs> really? What am I going to do there? I feel like, I'm again, I'm not going to fit in. Mm -hmm. So I ended up watching one of his sermons, and he was so powerful and yep. i was so hungry i ended up going there right and and i never looked at anybody as black or white or yellow i just saw was treated with so much love and um so he and i uh he invited me to go to our denver campus with um this person who is an incredible talent his name is, is israel houghton okay houghton Israel won six Grammys as a singer songwriter in the gospel category. Wow. So here we are on a plane together and I get moved by the spirit and I say, Hey guys, you want to work on a project together? And they say, what? And I said, well, let's do a music show together. Wow. And what kind of music show? And I said, well, let's do a music competition show. And uh, let's do it for Christians. Let's put together a worship group. Wow. And they were like, what? So uh, we said, okay, let's do it. And we recruited the two executive producers from The Voice wow. who, who, were not, who are not believers. And we're working together and hope we, who knows where it's going to go. But um, I refuse to take no for an answer. Mm -hmm. And maybe something special can happen wow. where, you know, Christians who have been given gifts of song and singing, maybe there's a place for them. Yeah. So right. that's, that's a project that I'm working on. And then, uh, it's funny, I had a woman who, um, who who prayed for my wife when she had a miscarriage. Mm -hmm. And a very wonderful, Marilyn Long, just a beautiful woman, and her husband, John, who uh, connected me with Biola. And she asked me if I would read a script and help out uh, a friend of hers. And I did. And the script was pretty good. It was uh, written by a, a young man named Aaron Therrell. 
And um, I just began a relationship with him, and he's a believer. And um, small movies, but I thought they were great. But uh, he ended up writing a TV script that it blew my mind. And it's an idea that I thought was, was incredible. So we're working on that project together. I have high hopes. So I have a handful of projects. I, um, I have a young, uh, young Vietnamese Americans, Don Lee and uh, uh, Danny Du, who um, they came to me and they said, we want to do a film in Vietnam. And I said, hey, don't reinvent the wheel. Tell me which TV show you'd like. I'll go get the rights and we'll remake it. Mm. So we did Bachelor Vietnam. No and, kidding. and that was all because, again, it's what most of the things that I do are like trying to help somebody else achieve their dream. Right. And I, I think that's um, an important lesson that, you know, we can learn from your story is that it's, you didn't necessarily confine yourself just to be a film producer. You jumped out and got involved with, um, you know, any opportunity that God has opened up in your life. And you did so in a way that, you know, um, allowed you to be a light in multiple industries, right? Not just film, but in tech, um, in music and in all sorts of different environments. So um, I, I love that about your story is that you didn't let, you know, your insecurities or your fears or whatever you felt like your skill sets was confining you to. And you let yourself sort of broaden your scope of um, who you are and how you can sort of use your gifts for the kingdom of God. Um, and I think that's really powerful. Um, I'm getting a few questions. One's from Grace, who is a film student um, at in Massachusetts. And I'm trying to figure out how to read her full question because it's only showing up in part form. But maybe, Grace, if you want to maybe uh, ask your full question in the um, comment section. But she's saying, during your period of hardship, did you feel like all the secular wealth and glory slash successes wasn't, I'm assuming it's, uh, wasn't worth all the pain and brokenness? that you went through? Is that, I think that's the question. I never thought it was not worth it. It is what shaped me. It is all a part of me. I don't have wealth. I'm comfortable, but I don't have wealth. Mm -hmm. I don't regret any of it. It was all a part of making who I am. And I am so thick headed and stubborn Right. that I needed to get the living crap kicked out of me to surrender. Right. So it takes losing to gain. It takes having one door closed to open up a much bigger, better opportunity. Um, so, you know, we all want to avoid failure. And of course I never look for it, but you know, you got to look at what failure brings. Yeah. Thank you for that question. And Grace is actually a, a, a scholar with the Eight Parables um, film retreat. We actually just had a film retreat where we brought together filmmakers and we're working on a film now that will be coming out later this year. So be on the lookout for that. So shout out to our, our scholar. I want to uh, ask Christian's question. Christian is actually um, the co-founder of a nonprofit in San Francisco called Mobilize Love. And they actually... Um, have uh, launched this fleet of trucks that provide multiple services in the Bay Area, including free food and free meals all across the city, especially in this time of pandemic. And they're doing this on a daily basis, providing um, tens of thousands of meals to people who are in need of food. So um, a shout out to them, check them out. And they're doing amazing things for the kingdom of God. His question is, what was the most effective Bible study or curriculum you led in those five years what was like yeah what were some of those bible studies that you were a part of and how did they kind of help you to um be ready so to so we yeah. didn't um i didn't lead bible study uh i would lead occasionally but the format that we followed was we let the spirit lead us but each week somebody would facilitate the conversation somebody different and that involved uh having each one of the members step up and take a leadership role Mm -hmm. And so because of that, magic was able to happen. We, we did first jump around, and then we decided to do um, uh, specific books. But um, it's, it, it, there's no hard and fast rules at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's great. Yeah. 
Um, and, and how, if people want to join or learn more about that, is that something that's available to the public or can they, um, you know, do you have any best practices as to how they can start their own if, if not? I'm no expert at that, but we'd love to have new members come and join. There's always turnover each week. It's been anywhere from 10 to 30 people. Lately, we've settled into the 12 area. It's yeah. a good number. Yep. Yes. Wonderful. Um, so I want to, I want to talk about one person. Sure. Because, you know, I, 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 there are a lot of people that I, um, ask for my mentorship and uh, I spend time with informally. And one is uh, uh, Kenneth Chang. And Kenneth, um, really gifted. You know, he's a rapper. He's a pastor, a youth pastor. He's a salesman. He's a writer. He was uh, an actor. And, um, you know, he was a little bit, and a, and a waiter. And he was a little bit lost. But I just couldn't understand how somebody who loved God so much, who was so talented, um, could be struggling. And um, the miracle of miracles happened. He went on TikTok and he said, I'm going to start a ministry on TikTok. Okay. And just was authentic and reached out to a younger uh, demo and talked about the creative process and took a stand and was very progressive while also preaching the word and loving. Mm -hmm. And he's turned that into a huge following. Wow. He's had some of his videos attract millions of people. Wow. And I just commented the other day that, you know, when he threw it all at the feet of Jesus and did it in service, right. all of a sudden he's become so productive and relevant. Wow. So everybody's path is different. Um, there's no linear ladder to achieve any kind of success. But, you know, I've often thought about the pursuit of happiness, and it's such a misnomer. It's not about happiness mm -hmm. it's about purpose it's about productiveness yeah if you could be of service to someone or something the chances are you're gonna grow wow wow that i mean that's the secret of it all right there i mean you're hearing it from the the man who's lived the height of heights in terms of successes and he's telling you know just the fact that you're saying that your secret is to serve others and to um, love others and, and make that the sort of mission of your life, that is what's given you more fulfillment than putting out a $100 million film. You know, after the $100 million film, you get the emails and the calls and the pats on the back. And I get to dine out on it for, for years and but it doesn't take away the emptiness. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Teddy, you should start, first of all, you should start a TikTok. And then second of all, <laughs> when you've done that, you need to start, you need to write your own book. So you can decide which order you want to do it, but that's, that's amazing. Um, we've got, we're getting a few more questions if you, if that's okay with you, Teddy. Sure, sure, let's do it. All right, so uh, shout out to Matt Park. Uh, he says, what advice would you give to someone at the peak of their success to avoid hitting their rock bottom? Pay it forward. Yeah. Pay it forward. Don't think about the me. You know, if you've achieved success, man, you got to pay it back. Wow. You have to treat people the way you want to be treated on the way up. Um, that's the way you can grow your network and grow your goodwill and and do charity work and be a role model and walk the walk and, um, you know, just be a visible role model. Yeah. Wow. That's beautiful. What 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 do you think that would have looked like for you um, while you are you know, the president of these studios? Um, what would that have looked like? How would you have approached your journey differently if you had uh, been a Christian then? 
Um, and what would you think? What would you think that that would have? I guess how would have that have like tangibly turned in, tangibly turned into action items that um, would have been different? Well, I'll, I'll tell you something. Uh, a lot of people don't know how. So when I was working for Biola, my job was to increase the university, the film school's profile with Hollywood. And most people have a lot of fear. Nobody wants to have somebody say no. I'm fearless. Wow. I've heard no so many times that it just rolls off because I'm going to get to the yes. So what did I do? I think people want to be asked to do good. Right. I went to Tom Shulman, who won an Oscar for Dead Poets Society. And I said, would you be willing to speak at the campus to Christian film students? He said, of course. I went to Mike DeLuca, who produced Social Network, who got nominated for Captain Phillips, who produced one of the Oscar telecasts. Right. Couldn't be more humble. Said, yes, what else can I do? Wow. I, I went to Devon, who's so booked wall to wall. Will you help out Biola? Of course. So um, a lot of people just need to be help, uh, asked. Mm -hmm. And um, they need to feel like they can really make a difference. And wow. that I think that desire is in everybody. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, I want to ask this question from uh, Esther, who is asking, how do you best balance be being right while staying empathetic? Uh, I think uh, Esther is somebody who I have leaned on for spiritual growth. And I think I could be a lot more humble about not always knowing the answer. Yeah. And... Um, um, I don't know. I don't know how to balance that. That's something I have to work all the time. I can still be an arrogant butthead. <laughs> I still think I can think um, my way is the right way, but it's not. And obviously everybody has their own style and their own um, maturation process and their own time and season. So I have more than anything now, I realize that I have to give people that room mm -hmm. to make all the mistakes that they would like to make until they can reach their point, their turning point. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I want to ask a question from Aaron. Um, you know, you talked about, uh, the t so what was the key turning point to uh, make you realize your identity was a facade that made you turn to Christ? And, you know, I think this is such an important question because we live in this age where, again, that facade, that image you put out there is more important than that real, genuine authenticity. So was there a turning point and what did that turning pro process look like? Yeah, it was uh, it was my divorce. It was to the point where I thought I didn't want to live anymore. So um, that's giving up. Um, but I realized giving up my life was not the answer, but giving up my way of life was the answer. Right. Um, I gave up knowing all the answers and I gave myself to, to Christ, mm -hmm. you know, so I look, I sound so pious, I sound so biblical, I sound so, so whatever. I'm still me, and it's still a struggle every day. And I'm sure my good friends would laugh if they heard some of this, but I think they would also half nod in agreement. So every day is a balancing act. It's, it's a challenge, but I'll tell you, as I, as I get older, it gets easier. It wow. gets easier. Yeah. And, and a lot of the people that I know are, are in the hard part of your lives. You're in your twenties, thirties, and forties. And yeah. it's a struggle, your identity, wanting to make it, wanting success, wanting to be loved. Um, I, I'm happy. I don't go through that anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, I, and I appreciate you know, you're saying that because, you know, we, it is a process. I don't think anyone's going to ever get to the point where they fully um, 
got, you know, are, are fully at the kind of peak of what it means to be a follower of, of Christ and being fully sanctified. Um, but I think what I love about your heart and, you know, your passion for people is that you're making um, every single day, it seems like you're, you're getting closer and closer to um, loving more, to using your skill sets and your experiences to help other people. And, you know, that's it. We're, we as a community are better off because of it. I know that I know that there's so many people whose lives you've impacted because of um, what you're doing today. And it's a beautiful journey. So can I can I say one thing that I, I, I think is really important? Okay. In my life, I was a consumer. Yeah. I was about the end product, whether it was money or goods or whatever. And I realized that having faith is about hope. Wow. And what is hope? Hope is not consuming the fruit. Hope is having the bag of seeds that can ultimately one day become not only fruit, but a grove of trees. Wow. Wow. And so for me, as long as I have hope, as long as I have a bag of seeds, as long as I have a dream, a bag of dreams, wow. I feel like I can live forever. I feel like my, my, my faith will grow. I feel like I have purpose. Because I know that God is going to deliver on his promises to, to prosper me and not to harm me. And I know that the more seeds I plant, the more people I serve, the more dreams I help come true, the greater chances that there will be groves of trees that can sprout real believers going forward. Wow. That's uh, that's. I think that's phenomenal. That's beautiful. Um, I've heard it once said that it's not about it's not about how much money you have in the bank, but the number of seeds you have in the ground that matters. And um, it seems like you've come to that realization that this is, you know, I, I just the way that you share, you know, kind of talking through your brokenness, but now talking through what your purpose in life is now is just, it seems like you've come so alive. And I could just sort of see it in the way you communicate and the way that your passion comes through in your eyes and the way that so many um, people just feel that sort of energy coming from you. And man, you look, you make 62 look good. I'll tell you that. I wish I could look <laughs> like you at 62. Um, that's beautiful. But uh, thank you. Thank, thank you so much for this time. I'd, I'd love for uh, people to learn about how they can um, follow you in your journey. How can they kind of, uh, can connect with you and how can they con continue to encourage you through this whole process what's your social media how can they find you well uh at teddy z on instagram please add me uh if you want message me i i am compulsive about trying to uh ah. keep my promise and my word and and uh reply um um you know add me wherever but uh um I really do use uh, social networks and uh, um, to stay connected. And during this pandemic, uh, I've actually feel like I've had an opportunity to thrive because of all of technology and, and the world is our oyster for all of us. And I just hope uh, and pray for everybody's uh, health and well-being, and, uh, yeah. um, and, and to try to, heal during this time but also find ways to take tiny steps forward that's beautiful and keep planting those bags of seeds that's right um, that's right hey well okay. thank you teddy this is such an amazing uh, conversation people can check it out on um, my instagram if you want to watch it again we'll make it live and yeah thank you teddy you are such a light and uh very much enjoyed this conversation you with you keep pressing on well, I, I want to I wanna thank you for what you're doing and to giving voice to other people and giving hope to a lot of others. And anyways, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Teddy. Take okay. care. Okay, bye. All right, bye-bye.